to discuss the role of digital technology and multi-sector partnerships in international development, please welcome Martha Brooks, former President and Chief Operating Officer of Novellis and Co-Chair of the Board of CARE, and Jenny Healy, Senior Advisor to the Administrator at USAID. To lead the conversation, please welcome back to the stage, Shamina Singh from the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Hello, everybody. What do you think about that J.P. Morgan Chase announcement? Good <laughs> Lord. Modest, really? Come on. <laughs> um, fantastic. Listen, we are, you, had, you, you heard flash talks earlier. You've had panel discussions as well. This is called the flash panel. <laughs> We're going to, in a relatively short period of time, um, talk about a really important issue. And that is this idea of the digital economy, as we've been talking about all day, the technology, as we all know about, but why and how this is impacting women and why we have to be intentional when we think about women and we think about this topic. And I can't think of two better people to have this conversation with than Jenny and Martha, who are going to take us through two examples of how um, a multi-sector partnership is forming between the private sector, um, the international development community, and of course the, the practitioners on the front line. So Jenny, let's start with you. I know Administrator Green has really been talking a lot about the role of private sector in international development. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. This is um, the topic of inclusive growth is not only just a priority at USAID, but something that's always at the top of the mind for um, the administrator when he's thinking about how to achieve our number one priority at USAID, which is helping countries move along their path towards self-reliance. And we at USAID view ourselves as our number one job is to work ourselves out of a job. How do we help countries achieve self-reliance? And that is just not possible for countries to do if they're not tapping into the entire potential of resources and talent of all their citizens. So for us, it is um, bread and butter of what we're trying to do in the journey to self-reliance is inclusive growth, inclusive development. And of course, we can't do that alone. We need the private sector to help us in doing that. And so seamlessly integrating the private sector into our development priorities has been something that the administrator has been focused on since day one. And that is for two very specific reasons. First and foremost, as Ajay said this morning, is it's just simple math. There is not enough money amongst donor governments and the NGO community to achieve all of our development priorities. Um, it just doesn't add up. And number two is because we shouldn't do it alone. So we can't do it alone. The math doesn't allow us to do it, but we also shouldn't do it alone because there's expertise and experience from the private sector that will help us achieve the goals um, quicker, better, faster, um, more sustainable for the citizens that we serve if we, if we take advantage of that. The administrator often says that private enterprise is the single most powerful force for lifting lives, strengthening communities, and accelerating self-reliance. So he launched last December a private sector engagement policy at USAID that's committed to operationalizing this concept to help us at USAID do better at bringing in and collaborating with the private sector. And this means doing, utilizing what we do well, but leveraging what they do well too, so that we can help bridge this gap, not only in the gap in resources, but the gap in experience and expertise, because we desperately need the experience and expertise, not just from our NGO community friends, but those in the private sector as well. So one example is uh, the many ways that we're partnering with MasterCard at USAID and their leadership as providing global financial services um, that we leverage what they do best, data analytics, technology, information, people, partnerships, and we combine it with what we do really well, which is development expertise, technical assistance, um, as well as our global footprint and our implementing partners. So for us, it's a no-brainer to collaborate with the private sector, not to just bring them in at the end and be like, hey, hand them a project and say, hey, have any in funding this, but actually bringing them in on the front end to say, hey, here's a development problem we're looking at solving. What do you think? What does your experience say? What does your expertise say? Because not only will the ultimate 
solution be better by having a broader, a bigger table, a broader door in that conversation, but that, um, and that will ultimately serve our citizens as well too, which one of the other really things that Ajay said earlier this morning that I think is so crucial in us at USAID really um, take to heart is this idea of building trust between the public sector and the private sector, and that we, it's crucial and needed in these conversations. So for us, we believe this policy and sort of institutionalizing it within USAID is a way to start building up our, our trust muscles to make it more of a muscle memory um, type of reaction as opposed to having to think about it um, and plan for it. It becomes more um, something that we do in all of our development conversations. That's so interesting. Can you just say a word about the WGDP initiative? Yeah, absolutely. So USAID is really excited to partner with the White House on their new Women's Economic Empowerment Initiative, the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative. It was launched earlier this year in February by President Trump and, and advisor Ivanka Trump. And its goal is to reach 50 million women by 2025. And it's a whole of government, first time ever, a whole of US government approach to empower women economically around the world in the developing world. And and what it does is it focuses around three pillars. And so the, the, the really cool um, sort of um, puzzle piece in all of this is to really focus the programming, the work around three pillars that are fundamental towards women's economic empowerment. So you have workforce development, you have helping women succeed as entrepreneurs, helping um, close that gap, the gap in access to credit, as well as helping enable uh, women being enabled in their environment. How do we get them fully and freely able to participate in their economy? And so at, for us at USAID, that means looking at um, ways, like with uh, Laboratoria who spoke earlier today, working on getting women in the digital sector and sort of and shrinking that digital divide to the great work that we're doing with MasterCard that started at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit this summer um, and announcing sort of USAID and MasterCard partnering together to um, further the WGDP initiative. And that is resulting in really exciting conversations about how do we together unlock tools for women in the digital and financial inclusion sector to really help them um, build their businesses, grow their businesses. Um, and, and as we all know, when women do that, they, they share it with their community, they share it with their family. That is the, um, that is the reason why it makes good business sense to empower women, um, is because we know what the evidence is. They, they pay back their money, they're, they're really good borrowers, um, but they also sort of look at growing their businesses in a way that um, sustainably and holistically helps their communities as well. Thank you for that. Martha, CARE has just been at the forefront of this for, what, 60 years now? A long time. Longer, long time. Yeah. And you've been a great partner to government. Tell us a little bit what, about women's economic empowerment. What, do you, what have you seen and what's left to do? So yes, a long time. We celebrate our 75th birthday um, next year. Um, but the last 60 years of it, I think, have been focused quite heavily on economic empowerment and particularly women's economic empowerment uh, because as you said, we do see women entrepreneurs when they make a profit, they invest it straight back into their kids' education and their family's health and, and it has huge benefits for the community. We've been building um, something we called Village Savings and Loans Associations which is a community-based saving model for almost 30 years and we now have about seven and a half million participants in that. Um, we have about an 85 to 90% retention rate of people carrying on participating in the savings models long, more than five years after we've left the scene, they're still doing it. And it's nothing more complicated than a lockbox, three keys, a set of training, um, and people being able to routinely save every week and then make loans to one another and then pay them back. And once a year, it pays out and you can invest in a tool to build your business. So we've got a pretty good arsenal of, of folks in at least 40 different countries. We operate in 90 around the world, but at least 40 of them have these VSLA models um, alive and well and thriving. And uh, many of them have graduated to substantial businesses. And we've seen a big gap in um, our ability to bring them the next level of fundraising or the, the next level of funding beyond what they're, so the most successful of them can't get a big enough loan from their community lockbox to make their business really sing. And so, so we are limited by their financial history and, and um, uh, their lack of technology, lack of bank accounts, lack of communication capability in some cases to, to go the next step. So we see that as a block. Um, we have the ambition to go from our seven and a half million to 50 
50 million over the next 10 years of, of those sorts of entrepreneurs. Um, and, and we need partners to, to deal with that. So we have to scale solutions that we know work. So we've started really with the poorest of the poor in really tough places, you know, wars in Afghanistan and, you know, difficult war zone places. Um, we work in Syria, we work in, we work in Jordan and, and Lebanon and places where there are a lot of refugees kind of pulling themselves up from the ground up and somehow people make businesses and thrive and come together. Uh, but there's a real gap. Um, there's just not enough of us to go around and never enough money to, yeah. to, to do it all. We need partners. We need lots of people to copy us. We want people to copy us. They have. So there, there are many other um, NGOs who use the same model. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's where we are. Um, and, and we do this every day um, and in all kinds of different cultures and countries and see tremendous potential um, and have some amazing success stories I'll share if we have a yeah. minute. So we um, are embarking on a partnership in three countries um, that are, we think will at least impact two million women small business owners. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can. What do you expect? So that was a cute, cute Tell us what fantastic you're gonna do. partnership. <laughs> so um, we are super excited um, today with MasterCard to announce um, our new partnership. Um, uh, MasterCard has given us five and a quarter million over a three-year program to operate in three countries, um, Pakistan, Vietnam and Peru. Uh, can you imagine three more different cultures and, and imagine the breadth of the learning we will have when we bring together their knowledge of the financial system and technology with our on the ground knowledge of how women organize, how they work. Um, your program goes beyond women entrepreneurs, but our focus is to really build women entrepreneurs in each of those places. So together with MasterCard, we have identified local financial service providers, maybe cell phone companies, and then the right local organizations that are women's organizations, maybe they're religious, maybe they are, um, well, not likely religious actually, but women's chamber of commerce or women's organizations of, of various sorts um, that will help us communicate and really tailor the marketing, tailor the products so that they are the kinds of, of products they need in any given country for, for where they are, and try and bring um, I think we're actually targeting to reach um, 4 million entrepreneurs. Uh, we won't succeed with all 4 million, but we will, we will reach 4 million of them who already have a couple of employees and are striving to grow their business. So, so from there, you know, I, I expect we will succeed. Um, uh, more than half of the people we bring into the program will be women in each of those places and, and really help take our learnings that we will distill and then share widely with USAID, our long-term partner, and so that you can use it in, in every program you operate and fund around the world. And then certainly with our other corporate partnerships, we'll, we'll want to um, repeat and copy. And it's all about scaling. Yeah. And, and scaling is very hard in the traditional way of philanthropy and, and, and NGO work. And just about every, every conversation we have these days at CARE is how do we scale what we know works? And the answer is you can't can't scale it alone. <laughs> there are not enough philanthropists to give write enough checks to scale it alone. We need we need partners and partners um, like Mastercard and USAID to do it. So well, it's interesting because I think that the scale play is also <clears throat> with because we have this technology technology solutions that we didn't have before that are now sort of being adapted fit for purpose for for use at the in the same way that at the um, micro level exactly yes. that mm -hmm. Chetna Senna, Senna earlier um, exhorted us to say do not create poor products for poor people I think that the idea here is to create and adapt the best products for everyone and so what does that mean in terms of food security and what does that look like I know you all announced a, a, another partnership with uh, my colleagues at MasterCard around food security can you tell us a little bit about that absolutely um, last week the administrator was excited to announce this new partnership with uh, MasterCard focused in sub-saharan Africa and smallholder farmers around digital platforms to promote financial inclusion and this will help them develop um, have access to financial resources to help them invest in their farms and their businesses and um, it's all around building this inclusive financial ecosystem to help folks um, 
and we think about it, especially in WGDP along the spectrum, of getting them into that um, idea of savings in the village, savings and loans programs. But the ultimate goal is to get the lending and financial institutions into this world of being of seeing either women-owned businesses or smallholder farmers as um, being part of the financial ecosystem. And so the partnership that we're super excited about to start with MasterCard is helping them bring, um, is, is taking advantage of MasterCard's digital solutions and expertise in financial services to the table with USAID, who will tap into our network of farmers and agribusinesses um, to pilot some of these really great MasterCard's digital technology and solutions. And so it will help us better understand um, the needs of smallholder farmers um, across sub-Saharan Africa um, and help connect to the communities that for many times this will be a first time um, being able to connect into the formal finance and mar markets opportunities. So we're excited about it. Well, I think that what I what both of you have brought to this conversation is this, what we heard earlier today from Ajay about mindfulness, intentionality. And I think that um, with you two as leading these efforts, I think we'll go a lot further, faster than we would have been able to do this alone. And before I call up our surprise speaker, I want to point to um, Natasha and Allison and Bile. Dalal and Parag, and these are the folks from the center team who are working with all of you on the ground to get this work done. So for the frontline practitioners, working with our frontline program officers, I think we'll make a very good, um, a very good team. And we just added Marla Blow, who is now leading our work in North America, which is especially useful to work with uh, Sandy Fernandez because our late-breaking announcement is from Victor Huang from the Kaufman Foundation. So why don't you come up, Victor?